Meine Damen und Herren, Ladies and Gentlemen, Ladies and Gentlemen, here we are. Yesterday we heard two things in view of the economic crisis and migration. People feel insecure and afraid. It might be easy to give simple answers to a complex situation, but this is a strategy of right-wing populists. The borders we should right away are those of our own solidarity to, towards people who need our help as the developing borders within our own society. I would like to talk with our guests to the experience of success of achieving this and how this situation is reflected in their countries and then talk how they in their artistic work and writing work as an activist. I would like to start with Javus Ekinci. He's dealing in his novels and short stories with the life of the Kurds in Turkey, with their struggle for self-determination and civil rights. He's also the publisher of a series of books with Kurdish exile literature. When we met on Sunday, he said he was shaped by experience, the experience to overcome borders. Would you please explain what you mean by that? Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, dear colleagues, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to be here among you. We discussed yesterday with Thomas that first I wanted to share an experience with you. Khaldun is one of the forefathers of um, sociology and economics, and she wrote something in the Middle Ages, geography is destiny. So he said, geography determined our life. And I would like to reflect and interpret the sentence um, against the backdrop of my light and to talk about how we could overcome these borders. In Kurdistan it was always mentioned in all and ancient sources as Kurdistan. And since the early 20th centuries, when the Ottoman Empire started to dismantle and new states were um, disintegrated, it was, Kurdistan was separated into four parts. The north, which became part of Turkey, the south, which became part of Iraq, the east, which became part of Iran, and the west, which became part of Syria. However, our forests, our valleys, and mountains are still linked to each other as our rivers, and they are still flowing where they used to flow before. But after the separation of the country, the people who live in this geographical area were integrated into a different society in, in Uganda than compared to Syria, Turkey, etc. So they became citizens of different states. These four states are states which do not have anything in common but the point that they have a joint policy towards the Kurds, one of a systematic assimilation. People who live within the Turkish borders are to a certain extent Turks, those in Iraq and Syria, Arabs and in Iran, Persians. And they use four different alphabets, the Arab alphabet, the Latin alphabet, and the Persian alphabet. Good 
In Musaibin, we have the situation. It's in Turkey, vis a vis Kamishlo, in Syria, Suraj, in Turkey, which you might have seen on television. It's just um, next to Kobani in Syria. Silupi is a Turkish town, Sacho, an Iraqi town, and they are direct neighbors. But they have different alphabets, different literature, different writers. The texts that are produced there differ. The Iranian Kurdish texts are Iranian texts. They are part of the society. I, for example, live in Turkey, and I wrote in Turkish as many other Kurdish authors. Selim Barakat, he wrote in, in Arabic, Murali Ahafrani, in Persian and Fuad Hussein in Arabic because he's living in Syria. And that is why we have this linguistic separation. People are curious and they like to probe things and I try to, to find out how my counterparts are writing. I went to a publisher and I suggested a project to them, a yellow series. And this series has the topic of the Kurdish society, independent of the language in which the text is written. They're all dealing with Kurdish literature, with topics of the Kurdish society. And I started to publish texts in Kurdish and Turkish language and to translate them myself. I would briefly like to, to talk about that before I answer Thomas's question. Arisaba is an English Jewish author living in Lausanne. Mulacic is from Varto. A Levitic region in Turkey. He lives in Amsterdam, and I live in Batman. And the three of us published novels at the same time. We belong to the same generation, born between 1972 and 1979. And about 2010, we all published a novel. If I simply say the name Arasaba wrote in English, The Paradise of My Father, Ishikash in Flemish, The Lost Earth, This yellow, are they published in translation or are they published in the original language? Sarı kitaplardaki eserler çeviri, yani mesela örneğin İngilizceden Türkçe ve Kürtçe'ye, Almanca'dan. For example, there have been translation made from English into Turkish or Kurdish or from German into Arabic or Kurdish and Turkish. And my novel was then called The Lost Earth of Paradise. We are three writers and we've written our novels at the same time. And the names, the titles of the novels are very similar. The Lost Honor of Paradise of My Father. Some say that this is about the history of the nation, but it's also a family story. Thank you very much, because the idea is tempting. The description you gave a, a series of books dedicated to the Kurdish society, no matter which language you use. And uh, I mean, we could also envisage such a series concerning the European history, no matter which language you use. Now, I'd like to address Rosa Alexam. She's an artist, a writer, a filmmaker. 
she focuses on the representation of non-conventional lifestyles or ways of life and life between the cultures. When we talked last night, she mentioned the aspects which trigger uncertainty, migration, movements, economic crises, but there are other aspects she would like to ponder in her statement. Please, the floor is yours now. I have many statements, but uh, but uh, those things what I'm just now very interested in is the is the political situation in uh, in every uh, Scandinavian and Nordic countries, because you know we have had this uh, fantastic uh, Scandinavian values uh, after the Second World War, and we have lived in a paradise in uh, in Nordic countries. But uh, something has happened um, under the last, uh, let's say, five years. We have got this, um, in every country, we have got these uh, populistic parties, and some of those, um, or part of these parties are, are Nazis, and they say we are Nazis. And for example, in Finland, we have in our government uh, now, uh, many ministers from that uh, active Finsky. <laughs> what is this, this name in? Uh, how can we say the name of this party? Active Finn. Echten Finnen oder die? Echten. Sagen Sie nochmal. Die wahren Finnen. Die wahren Waren, Finnen. Die, die wahren okay. Finnen. Ja. Die wahren Finnen. Oh, and um, and in Sweden we have this uh, Swedish uh, Sveriges Demokrater. Or Norge, in Norway we had the Breivik, uh, Breivik call, uh, uh, uh, minister, eco people. And um, there are a lot of uh, people in every Scandinavian countries who vote this, um, these populistic parties. And uh, that is very problematic because uh, uh, you know, at the same time, these parties uh, have very, very conservative values, what they are all the time uh, putting into the practice. And uh, those main elements of these, uh, these parties are hate of Muslims, hate of refugees, hate of women, and hate of equality. And uh, uh, that, that is the biggest problem, I think, for today in Scandinavia. And so we can ask why people are voting these people, uh, these parties. And that's what I have uh, uh, searched uh, uh, for uh, last uh, three, four years. So I also wrote a book about uh, these phenomena. And I did it in that way that the book is full of monologues. And those people who vote these populistic parties have, op uh, have opportunity in this book to tell their opinions, why they really uh, vote these parties, and why they even think that the Nazi system was a good one. Darauf werden wir gleich auf. We will come back to this question, but I would like to ask Ivana Zaiko first to take the floor. She is a writer and a playwright. And we are very happy to announce that we will hear more and see more of her in the near future. She will be a DAAD guest for a year. And in Croatia, the situation has aggravated, in particular because a right wing minister of culture has entered office two months ago. Tell us, please, a bit more about what this means for you. Do you hear me? Yes. First of all, uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. 
I must say I have a certain stage fright because in this moment I don't have a feeling that I'm here on this stage privately as an artist, uh, as is the usual position. I feel that today I'm here as a representative of almost 5,000 uh, people who signed the appeal for dismissal of Croatian Ministry of, Minister of Culture, uh, Mr. Hasan Begovic. And not only them, uh, I have a feeling that I represent much more people, activists, uh, cultural workers, and uh, intellectuals and citizens of Croatia who are right now really uh, fighting against the, the division of society which is, which is happening in Croatia. Just uh, yesterday, uh, 400 people made a, a huge row, a huge queue, uh, in front of the Croatian government and each one of them uh, had uh, a document request for maintaining uh, civil society in Croatia and each one of them uh, gave this document to the to the uh, uh, hand out this document uh, officially to, to the government so this is what happens in Croatia right now I think that the whole story started as Thomas said few months ago when a uh, uh, new Croatian government uh, made a so-called patriotic uh, uh, coalition and appointed uh, Minister of Culture Zlatko Hasanbegovic, who very quickly became a sort of uh, ideological icon of the government itself. Um, I will, I will try, I, had, I have a few notes because I don't want to forget some things, some uh, concrete things that he made in the first uh, weeks of, of uh, his, his being, uh, uh, him being uh, uh, at the position of Minister of uh, Culture. Um, I think that one of the symbolical statements that he had at the beginning was one saying, uh, Anti-fascism is not the foundation of this country, it's just an empty phrase. I don't know, can you imagine how this statement, which was said at public television, is strong? And this statement is said by somebody who is Minister of Culture. Of course, after this statement, what we did the first was this appeal for dismissal of, of, the, uh, of the minister. But uh, unfortunately, the government is still defending him. I will tell you just a few notes what he did. Uh, his first move was to uh, cut the support completely for independent media. Uh, independent media were, is the place in which you hear critical voices. Independent media is the place in which you get information. So right now, uh, uh, there is no financial support whatsoever to the independent media. The second thing was that he helped uh, uh, to dismantle uh, the structure of the public television. All editors, but all editors of the television uh, and in the radio were dismissed. And so now the new people are on this position and the program is completely changed. Uh, what happened next? Uh, foundation for the development of civil society in Croatia uh, is dismissed too. Uh, what he did in media, uh, Minister of Culture, Mr. Hasan Begovic, um, it was a sort of the... Um, uh, hunt for artists and culture workers. Uh, he uh, introduced the rhetoric, which was never heard in Croatia, rhetoric that says that culture workers, artists, are parasites of the society. If you have country which is so poor, impoverished as, as Croatia is now, uh, and you have these kind of statements, this is really very, very serious. So in the last few months, the artists, the writers, the actors, uh, act, uh, actors uh, uh, directors had been attacked, physically attacked on the street. What happened is that Minister of Culture, together with the President of Croatia, uh, made a statement which says, uh, uh, I will try to um, paraphrase it, that those who provoke should take some consequences, should be aware that there will be some consequences. 
So in this sense, you have a sort of the war on criticism, war on humor, war on, uh, on, uh, on satire. How can you have a free society that looks like this, in which bit by bit people are afraid to talk publicly? But not only this, people more and more don't have a visual uh, uh, um, place, places from which they, they can talk because all the media all of a sudden is closed. So this is, this is the situation in which we are living uh, uh, right now. Uh, I don't know, maybe I, I forgot something. Uh, now the budget of Ministry of Culture is announced. So all the projects, all the institutions, all the organization that were critical, that had anything to do with uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, with the values of some kind of uh, uh, development uh, uh, uh, uh, society uh, have been reduced funding or they don't, they don't have fundings anymore. So this is the situation in Croatia and uh, I'm very proud to say that there are so many people daily and weekly doing some actions and I think we will talk more about this and um, yeah, so this is, uh, I, I think this is a sort of the outline of what is happening in Croatia right now. And I think this is really something serious because uh, I, I, I feel that uh, uh, there is the, this trend of, of this populistic, uh, uh, uh, populistic uh, uh, uh, movement in, the, in, in, in the Europe and that for the countries uh, as, as Croatia, which is really, which is poor, which is in uh, deep economical uh, uh, trouble, um, literature, or <clears throat> only literature or only, only art is, is not enough to, to, have, uh, to, to, to bring some mm. uh, practical solution to, to the problem, which is really serious. Thank you. We will come back to this question in a minute, but I would like to introduce Peter Terin first. He is a playwright. He writes stories, novels, and columns. And since we are dealing with Europe, I would like to tell you that he was awarded the EU Literature Prize. Prize. Now, yesterday in a break, we talked and we said that it's extremely important that writers in their texts need to react in view of the current situation. Now, before we talk about this aspect, I would like to mention another aspect because Peter lives in Brussels and he told me yesterday that the big question we are dealing with in Brussels is that why haven't we anticipated what happened on 21st March. What did you mean by this question, I wonder? Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you for being here on this beautiful day. Uh, I don't live in Brussels. I live in, um, I live in the countryside. Sorry. No, that's OK. That's okay. <laughs> Brussels is only half, half an hour away. Um, yeah, 22nd of March was uh, for our country a big shock because we are very peaceful people. We are uh, the living uh, compromise in Europe. Belgium is a, is a country that has, uh, was founded in a compromise. We have a bilingual nation and uh, there's actually three official languages. We have many, many, many governments which cost us lots and lots of money. But we are not at war, so that's good. We don't uh, try to kill each other because we speak a different language, which is a good thing. Um, there has been lots of talk about refugees and immigrants, and one of my colleagues from Cyprus, I think, even used the word settlers, which has a very 19th century ring to it, uh, uh, which was well chosen. Um, I think we're, we're forgetting something in these discussions, and we're forgetting that uh, all these uh, center-right or even uh, extreme-right governments have been elected. They have been elected, and they have been elected in the uh, follow-up of a big international economic crisis. Now, there has been lots of... Um, I'm not going to be political. I'm, I'm, I'm, I don't regard myself as a politician. And I do not sit here to represent 
any group of people at all. With all respect, Ivana, you're right to mention your, uh, your worries, but um, I am not in this situation. I think of myself as a writer as being at the center of everything. Uh, you could compare it by being on the North Pole, and everywhere you look is south. And I think that's a very good position for a writer. And he understands that Rosa is trying to um, understand in her work why we have these governments. It is important for a writer, I think, to uh, have the same distance to the left as to the right. If we want to change something, if we want our work to be valid and not become too political engaged, engaged in the sense that you don't have to read it to know what's in it, which is for me the death sentence of every novel, of every book. You have to start a book not knowing what will happen. If you as a writer profile yourself too much as left or right or whatever, you make yourself mute. You should talk in your writing. That's my strong belief. So I try to do this. In my books, I try to understand people that I don't understand. And that's a, that's a huge task. It's, it's not the easy way, of course. It's the, it's the difficult way. But you have to listen to the stories that you write. You have to listen to your characters. And that's what I'm trying to do. So we should all, if we, you know, there has been some Europe bashing yesterday. Europe is, you know, is these values, okay, but, you know, look what we do. We have lots of moral borders within ourselves. Of course, we do, we have. People are irrational. We forget that people are irrational. We, we, we talk here and we treat them, we talk about people as if they are very logical. And if we only put the right reasons into them, they will follow us and they will do what's right for, for humankind and for the country and whatever. We forget humans are irrational. They don't react like we would like. That's because religion will always be a part of humankind. Even if some people think it's ridiculous, you know, to believe in a God and whatever. It's part of our DNA. We cannot forget that. So, maybe this sounds very political. After all, I don't know. <laughs> yes, <laughs> sorry. Um, but I'm not political. And to go back to Belgium, um, where I started, um, the situation is, of course, very uh, difficult at the moment. Um, we don't know what to do. We don't know how to uh, differentiate between immigrants and refugees. Um, all of a sudden, we have this reaction to be very conservative, to be, go back to Christianity, to really go back to Roman Catholicism as a kind of a counter reaction to uh, the Islam. Uh, there are certain aspects of Islam that I think we, as Europe, we cannot tolerate uh, about gender, about, uh, you know, mutilation, about uh, the rights of women. We cannot tolerate this. We cannot tolerate that certain segments of the Islamic world or the uh, um, um, immigrants uh, in our big cities would like to have Sharia back or would like to implement this. We cannot accept this. But it's very hard to have a discussion as soon as I say this, and I'm very aware of this, people will look at me and think, oh, he's one of them. And I don't, I, I hope not, of course, but it's very, very hard to have a discussion. And it's very easy to talk, you know, they, to preach for your own church. That's very, that's, you know, there's nothing to it. But what about preaching for somebody who thinks different? Preaching is the wrong word, of course, you know, you don't have to preach. But um, that's what I'm trying to do, that's what I try to do in my work. If I speak, I don't speak a lot, you wouldn't tell, but I don't speak a lot. <laughs> but um, I try not to speak a lot, I try to... I want to hear the writers in their books, you know. This conference is beautiful, it's a European writers' conference, but the works of the people have been not present. They have been there on the, on, on the book stand, but they have been, not been present. I want to know, I want to meet the, the writers when they are alone in their offices and write. What kind of people are they then? <coughs> Because we all play a role. We ha I have many personalities. Sometimes they conflict and sometimes I contradict myself, like Walt Whitman wrote. Um, but we all play roles. And this is now, you know, sort of my role. Now I speak 
as a writer who is slightly upset and um, grieving and um, in the public eye. Um, but when I'm alone in my room um, writing, I am someone different. And I think that's the real me. You can, you can meet the real me in the literature. So it's a European Writers' Conference, but to sum it up, I've heard lots of politics and I haven't heard many writers. Dann wollen wir doch jetzt mal. Wollen wir doch jetzt eine Autorin hören. Now let's listen to an author, Rosa Lixum. You said in your last novel, that's life, the title, people say something which elected the true Finns. Um, at what Peter Turin said, you try to understand people who do something which um, contradicts your thinking and your attitudes. What did you understand when you wrote this novel? What are the motives of these people to really elect the true Finns? Okay, there are very, very many motives and uh, one, one uh, biggest motive uh, uh, among Finnish people is not fina financial crisis, not the climate change, but the change, uh, the, um, the situation, how the technology changes our world so rapidly. So people are really... Uh, uh, worried about uh, uh, robots coming and the uh, artificial intelligence and uh, this uh, all these changes what are just now among us i mean the uh, the uh, how the work is changing there are no no more working places before those factories went to china and to come uh, uh, uh, vietnam Finnish, Finnish uh, uh, industry went there, but not anymore because now the robots are in Finland also, like they are in China making all the work and uh, people are not uh, anymore needed. And uh, also this situation that uh, uh, all this, uh, uh, or part of this work uh, what uh, um, people do in hospitals and with uh, with old people, so there are robots uh, doing that job, and people are really afraid of that. That how we can live with these robots in a in a house for old people, and uh, and uh, this uh, populistic party, for example, in Finland, gives very simple. Uh, answers uh, about life so that uh, that uh, this uh, this populistic party in finland so they give a new identity for for people who have lost their identity as a workers for example and so there are a lot of people so uh, workers who are now without job and who can't never get any job more because uh, it's automatized. Their jobs are automatized. So uh, uh, they have lost their identity as a worker and now this populistic party gives to them new identity as a true Finnish people who really create this, uh, this country and this welfare. And we don't want to share this welfare with any Muslims, any refugees, and uh, any other people. So uh, we want to keep all this by ourselves. And the same, same uh, voices you can hear in, in Denmark and in Sweden. Uh, and um, that is the biggest fear, fear for the future. <laughs> how we can get living because there are no work, all is automatized. So how we share uh, uh, all the incomes that pe uh, so that people can live. And the future seems to be so that it's not equal. 
There are a lot of rich people uh, owning these factories where the robots are working 24 hours in a day, no holidays, no uh, salary. Uh, but those people will keep their money and say, put them in these um, tax-free countries in Europe. And so the gap between rich and poor people are really, really growing all the time. So that, that, is, that was one. At one point uh, was very interesting because uh, some... Some of, some of my friends, uh, what happened? Some of my friends uh, who have been voting for Greens, Green Party, for 15 years, now they vote this terrible populistic party. And when I ask them how this is possible that you vote for this nazist, so they say, yeah, but, but uh, you know, uh, this political system is so boring and he, it has continued so many decades that they really want something new and some colorful and flashing and, you know, uh, something new. So, uh, as you said, uh, people are making these uh, decisions uh, uh, not so much politically, there are many different reasons, and uh, uh, not uh, rationally. Uh, but I think it's terrible. But anyway, uh, so um, that is my conclusion. That is not that is one step further in this panopticum of terror. If your own friends start to elect populists, I agree to a certain extent with the explanation that there is insecurity, a sense of insecurity that people are afraid, which to, to which you respond irrationally. However, the leaders of these parties are intellectuals. These are academics. They do not act because they are afraid of something. They are very purposeful, and that is what Ivana has seen, and you have seen this also in Belgium. What can we do about it? Uh, can I say one point? I, yeah. Uh, because, uh, in fact, in Finland, uh, uh, these nazist ideas never died after the Second World War. You know that we were aligned to, uh, to German Nazis uh, during the Second World War. So they never died. They only went uh, underground and waiting for the right uh, moment to come back. And now they are back. Just. Yes. Thank you. Um, first of all, I, w I would like a bit to, to reply and, and to stretch the, the conversation further for what Thomas, uh, uh, Peter said, sorry, uh, about writing from the position of another, trying to understand somebody who is completely different from yourself. Uh, and you have right, this is political uh, stance. It's not only literature, it's, it's something that I think we missed in the political reality around us. I'm talking now about, about uh, Croatia, for example, but I think that maybe it can be similar to some other societies and countries. That you have, for example, left intellectuals, you have people who, uh, who can be seen and heard publicly, but when it comes to some issues, to some fears, to certain emotions, they do not discuss them because they are just too banal for them. But in the same time, you have these hidden Nazis, you have the right wing that are uh, advocating these questions, that have some opinions and some cures for those uh, uh, emotions and fears. And all of a sudden, uh, the situation in society is changed. Um, Last month, we, one of the actions that we organized on, on the night of, of the book, Night of Literature, 
was that we organized uh, a reading that happened in the same time in 25 cities in, in Croatia. And what we read uh, for one hour at the same time was the essay of Umberto Eco, uh, essay about war fascism, essay about eternal fascism. And uh, um, I, I, will, I, I noted again something, and I think that it's so, um, uh, the essay uh, it tells us about the symptoms and conditions of, of the fascism in the society, of the right wing uh, in, uh, uh, uh, uh, um, um, influence uh, in, in the society. So uh, here what he says, how can we notice that something is changing? All of a the sudden there is a cult of tradition, all of a sudden uh, conservatism, mm -hmm. all of the sudden irrational uh, statements all around us, all of the sudden terms like treason comes out. There is a fear of diversity, there is obsession with conspiracy, there is a hate and disdain towards the weak and the poor. I, I, can, I can recognize Europe today in this. So what can we do? Hmm. Uh, when I talked a few years ago with my colleague, a writer from Montenegro, uh, Andrei Nikolaidis, we were in some kind of panel and we were talking about engaged literature. And I was like, I had uh, uh, this, uh, um, uh, um, I, I took position for me, which maybe, maybe Peter has right now. I said, yeah, I mean, let's talk about the literature and please, uh, who cares about the literature? Uh, in, uh, what can literature really do? I mean, don't fool ourselves. Who, is in, in, who would be interested in, in literature? And then I was, like, I was then a rather posh, and I said, can you tell me, please, what society it would be who would care about what I write and how I write? And then Andrei Nikolaidis answered, it would be totalitarian society. And then I understood, yes, really. And today, all of a sudden, I have a feeling that it's really very important what I write. Evet, hep soruyoruz ne yapmalıyız, nasıl yapacağız? Of course, we constantly ask ourselves what we can do, what we should do. And how we got where we are how we, what we can do about the rise of the, the right wing, not only in Europe, but worldwide. The refugees who have come to Europe is not something that has only happened in recent years. We saw the Gulf, Gulf War live on television. I was a child myself and it was perceived to be very distant, something you could only see on television. That is what we thought then. And I was always surprised that usually you you got these horrible news um, over lunch or dinner time. It was weird to, to see that it was at the same time you had something to eat and you had these horrible news on television. The terror of people fleeing from Iran and Syria, I, I, I, I saw myself personally and, and also there has also been a war in my country for 25 years and that people leave really everything behind to save their pure lives and that is something which I saw personally myself two or three years ago when the Syrian um, refugees came in from Shengal and in the Yazidic region and I'm sure that people would never have wanted to leave um, this region and to leave everything behind just running away. They simply came to save their naked lives. There's no doubt about that. What can we do about it? Can we share it with people here? And how do you meet, encounter these refugees who have fled tyranny, suppression, war and violence? 
which they have been subjected to for centuries to a certain extent because it goes back to the division of the countries in the late 19th century. I would like to quote William Faulkner when he gave his speech when after he received his, his Nobel Prize. He didn't want to reduce a human being because we have so much to lose because the pain and the suffering of a person is the value of the world. If we think of the world as a boat, um, Europe might be on the upper deck, but when the boat will drown and the upper deck will also be flooded. And you cannot save yourself by building a wall around the upper deck. The people in Syria might have never seen the sea, but they are now crossing the sea to get here. And you can't achieve anything with short-term solutions. And that is not only a European problem, but a worldwide problem. Faulkner said, I reject it to reduce people to their problems. Thank you. Again, as yesterday, again and again, we should recall that we should have a universal perspective, which is not limited to Europe only. Nevertheless, there's still the question, what can we do? One thing is to write literature to reach the other or understand the other. But these books are not read by the others. They might not be interested in literature at all, and they don't even want to talk to us, which reminds me of a discussion which I had um, with my father when I was 15 years old. He told me, I won't talk to you. I discuss with you because you're always right and you're superior in a discussion. And so we use means, uh, literature, and you said preaching, so we have always been preaching to the believers anyhow, and we offer dialogue, etc. But um, our weapon is not sharp. We don't reach the others. First of all, um, I think writers uh, can only write, so we, we shouldn't... Uh, mm -hmm try to do anything else. We should write as, as good as we can. And if we do this, as if we write, if we tell our stories as precise as we can, as Ezra Pound said, you know, you have to quote uh, an, an important po a poet, I'm sorry, but um, as Ezra Pound said, uh, the one sole morality of writing is the fundamental accuracy of statement. We have to be precise, we have to be clear. If somebody picks up a book by us, it has to be clear. And everybody should be invited in the book. In the book, there has to be space for someone to enter the story. And if you say we only, uh, our books are only read by uh, uh, people like us, I don't agree. If we, if we start thinking like that, we, we should stop writing, you know. Uh, it's not like that. That's why I say if you keep your distance, if you, if you have empathy, if you try to have empathy with a extreme uh, right uh, person and you have the empathy with a refugee, if these can come together, then you have an interesting book. Then you have a book where the discussion is enclosed. It's not a polarization between books by this one and by that one, but within the story itself, the discussion is a topic and then you can reach people. You, you, you cannot reach people if they um, if they already know what you're going to write, if, if you already know, uh, oh, that's, he's like that, and, and there is prejudice, you know, there's, there's of course, we, we all, we, we're human creatures, we have prejudice. Um, that's how we survived uh, when, when we had tough times in prehistory, you know. You, you have to, uh, uh, your, your brain cannot take all the information, you have to make some certain decisions at, at certain times, and prejudice is one of those decisions, right? So, try to, that's what I try as a writer, not 
to be um, already uh, known as a person. You know, try to do it in your work. Because the, the thing, yesterday we talked about power as well. You know, what is the power of a writer? Well, the power of writing, of literature, and it, I know this is very hard to swallow, but it's barely existing. It is, you know, it, we are not in the 19th century anymore. Uh, it is hardly existing. And the only time writers really come on television or on media is to be there, uh, or they are satire, or they, they are uh, shown as a kind of clowns, uh, or they already um, uh, make a statement that everybody knows already, because media are very conservative as well, you know. They like to know what's coming on. So, forget about power there. The, the power of, of literature is in the book, is in the text, and not in the writer. That's my belief. Yes, please. Yes. So, uh, uh, my situation is uh, that kind uh, a little bit different because uh, I'm an artist too. So I have a really different kind of many medias uh, uh, to work with. And I, do, I have done it uh, 35 years now. So I make uh, videos, I make movies, I, I photograph, I use me, uh, me, uh, internet quite a lot, uh, putting my pictures there. And so writing is another thing. But, uh, but uh, today, a picture is very strong. So I have worked the uh, uh, last uh, 10 years with uh, Afghanistan burka, burka uh, in my photographs. And it's, uh, it's very, very uh, at, uh, attractive for uh, young people today, these photographs. Uh, yeah, because those people who don't read books, they, they love photographs. And you can put so much, uh, much um, uh, input in every photo. And um, uh, if I think about my, my um, work as a writer, so I never put feelings in my books. I, I try to describe uh, those uh, or write those stories so that the reader get a lot of uh, feelings, but they are not in the in the story. It, they are behind the story. So so that uh, and also I don't give any answers because I don't have any answers, but I I have the right to. Um, to put on the light those things which I feel is very important to discuss. And uh, one thing is that I used to go to schools also to discuss with teenagers. And it's always so that uh, they read my books beforehand because they have to read them. And then I go to school with, to discuss with them. And that is very, very uh, important thing because teenagers are very eager to discuss when you go there. And so uh, we can go very, very deep together uh, uh, on the questions concerning society, or the whole society, globalization, human being, what is uh, homo sapiens uh, uh, as a species, and so on. Can I, uh, can I also add something? Um, as, as, as, as, uh, I would like just to, to, to add, because um, uh, I, I, I never spoke about that um, as, as I direct and I perform. In some way, um, I have a feeling that exposing yourself in front of the audi audience gives you opportunity to see the people that you talk to, to see the people that you are trying to communicate with. Uh, also, you know, to expose yourself as a citizen, citizen who does something in public, on the street, I mentioned recently this reading, 
you get to know society better. I will give you an example which is really bad. Uh, I was reading this essay at uh, the main square in Zagreb, and each time I would uh, uh, read out anti-fascism, uh, the guys around me would scream down with communism. Can, I mean, there is no sense for me. But what, what you can tell from this is that society is really divided on the people who read and the people who don't read, people who have knowledge and people who are ignorant. And those ignorance, are, there are more and more of them. And that's why when we think, okay, what can we do? The thing that really we can do and we must fight for is education and culture. And this is, this is, this is what we really can do. And for example, how can we fight for this? First, and the most practical thing is that we always, but always react when somebody is trying to pull off uh, uh, uh, the money, because culture and education must be free and must be financed. And this is something that is really European value. This is our achievement. United States never, or maybe during the Cold War, never had education and culture which is so much financed and supported by the government. This is our achievement. And it, it, it, it, I mean, it, and it's not something that, was, uh, that we had before, for example, Second World War. No, it's something new. And we must take care of this because this is, this is where, this is a platform for the healthy and better society. So yes, of course we can do something. And, I mean, it's not really activism. It's something that you do as a, as a citizen. It's nothing special. We do it for ourselves. We do it for our children. And that's it. And here wäre tatsächlich auch eine Möglichkeit. Now, this would also be an opportunity for the EU. So there, where you don't have any funding anymore, the EU could intervene. But there is someone from the floor who wants to make a statement. I just wanted to say that I think that the whole problem is this kind of cocktail which uh, mm. Peter uh, fixed for us, because I think that you cannot mix two things, writer writing and writer as a, as a human being, yeah? And a part of human society. So I think that when I'm writing, it's one thing. The other thing is that I'm not just a writer, I'm a person. So I'm responsible for my life and life of others. So uh, maybe because I'm from the country which were under the communism for a long time and Partly because, because of writers, it was a big change from communism to democracy. And it was also because of the writers, because I think that why the civil society need writers and why we are here is that writers have a talent to say something, to put words together and to address the other people the way that those words have meaning and weight that people can understand them better or they can hit the point sometimes very good. So I think that's why it's very important that writers should be interested in what's going on in their countries and societies and to raise their voice. Because I didn't know what's going on in Croatia and I'm very happy that I, I've heard this kind of thing because to say that, also when you've said that a writer shouldn't be the person who is kind of defining himself. I want to define myself as an anti-fascist. Like, I don't see any, any reason why not. Like, in my books, of course, there could be people who have very different opinions. They can talk about things, but those are the characters. It's not that I, I'm not sure about myself where I'm standing, and I'm sorry, it doesn't make me a worse writer. Not at all. Like, think oh, no. about Václav Havel, yeah? Like, I don't think that he was a great writer, he was a great person, but like Hans Magnus Enzersberger or Italo Calvino, or, yeah, I think that a lot of writers were raising their voice to help something or to, I don't know, I think that to be against violence is something which, which is very valuable and I don't want to be deprived of 
define myself like that just because I'm a writer. That's all. But I have, I have, I've never said that you cannot be uh, politically engaged or that you can have certain views or that you, you know, the act of writing is a statement in itself. You know, it is something that is an engagement. You know, you, you talk about people, you show what people are like, what we are like. Um, so I think that's political in itself. And of course, some writers will be more, uh, um, will have a better political talent. Uh, I don't have that. I'm just, you know, I'm a simple uh, storyteller. And I think um, you can, you know, we, we're always talking about reaching those people who don't read. I think we need to, you know, we, we don't have to fall on our knees for them and, and, and do something we don't want to do, but we have to keep our stories clear and simple to show them something, in a way, I think. And I'm afraid that if my political views are too much involved in the book, that would, you know, might prevent them to try to read my story. And I want to tell the story because it's about humans, whatever they are, links, uh, uh, left or right, it doesn't matter. Um, so for me, the quality of a writer is in the writing and not uh, so much in his opinions, I think. Yeah. We have lots of opinions. We have, you know, there's a, there's a big polarization of, of our society and it's getting worse because uh, we are directed by algorithms, by Facebook, you know. If, if, some, if, you, if you give five likes to people who have a certain stance on a, a certain demonstration or they, they, they post a certain uh, film video about something, Facebook will make sure that you keep in this circle and you are prisoned in, in, a, in a circle of uh, the same opinions. And I think this polarization is also visible in politics. Of course, you know, you talked about poli uh, politicians who, um, um, who are smarter than the people, of course. And the only thing politicians uh, think about is the next election. You know, if we do this, this will cost us votes. And sometimes they make very difficult decisions. I, I, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for politicians, but you can see the fear of the politicians as well. They are very, very frightened that they will do the wrong thing and they will not get, you know, re-elected or their party will suffer or whatever. So it's something you can divide through the whole society. And one more thing, then I'll shut up. Um, another thing is that um, the whole refuge, I, I was kind of mentioning it before, but the, the refugee crisis is, of course, a, crisis, a big crisis, uh, apart from what's happening in Syria, because there was an economic crisis just beforehand. The economic crisis has made uh, people vote for more uh, economical-based parties, who are traditionally more right-wing, center-right, not extreme-right, sometimes yes. Uh, and this means that money, has, uh, economics has become far more important than we think. We, in Belgium, for example, the only thing we had, just like uh, with you, Ivana, cuts. We have to cut in, in this, we have to cut not only in arts, but in, over the whole spectrum of society, we have to make cuts. So people, be ready, be prepared, because it will hurt. But we'll make a Europe that's, um, the, the figures will fit, you know, the, the figures will be right. That's what they tell us. But anyway, people have been, heard, have been hearing this time by time. You know, be prepared, your pension will be less, uh, healthcare will be less, social uh, uh, uh, care will be less. And then, then we get the, the, the, the refugee uh, mm. coming in, in, in big quantities. And of course people say, oh, but who's going to pay this? So this is, a, for me, this is a, really a part, it's not about so much about moral values, it's more about how the economics has started to uh, determine how we think. I think. In the Reihenfolge der Meldungen. There are several requests for the floor. And the gentleman first, please. I would like to come back 
to the concept of writing down Niederschreiben. We are talking about European values, and the question is how can you draw a line between writing and Europe? In other words, how can you write down boundaries? Could you please introduce yourself? I can see you. Thomas Cutter, Münster University. May I give an answer? Merely is my name. Because I would like to answer, because I would like to build a bridge, because this is exciting and this is true. And um, I think it's extremely important what Peter has said. And that's why I would like to answer the question from the audience. It's exciting because there are four writers or authors, two from countries where you can write whatever you want to write, where you are free, where your freedom is complete. And then there is Ivana from Croatia, where every provocative word could be seen as dangerous. And then there is Javus from a country whose president has just declared that writers are terrorists. So we have to see the context and writing fulfill different functions depending on the context, irrespective of whether the writer wants it or not. I mean, Peter, if you want to write a love story, you write a love story. It, it's good. But if um, someone else, Javus, for example, goes and writes a love story, it's a different setting. And those who don't want to have him write won't go. And and read the story or see it completely differently. And I would like to add that I was standing in front of a prison when I was a little girl because my parents were inside. And when I asked why are they in prison, they said, well, because they are using a language which is banned. Whereas my father used to tell me this is about a powerful language. And he had been the editor, a publisher of an extremely important publishing house for Kurdish literature in Turkey. Now, this was what happened 30 years ago. Now, this is what I experienced in the past, standing in front of the prison walls. So we do have to see the context. Yavuz does something which can be compared to writing boundaries down. But it's different from what you do, Peter. There are different social functions which are being fulfilled, but it depends on where you live and what language you use for your work. So it's not depending on what you write about, i.e., we are dealing with different facets or sides of one and the same coin because it's also depending on who reads and who attributes a meaning to what you write. Yeah. I would like to give a, sh a short answer. Of course, I mean, uh, I'm here sitting as a Belgian writer and not as a, a Turkish Kurd or a Syrian writer, of course. Uh, I, I'm slightly offended that you accuse me of only writing love stories, because um, I write much more than that. Actually, you know, the, the, the topic of... You know? Okay. The... the, the the topic of, of this panel discussion was, uh, was uh, borders, and uh, I've written a, a novel about, um, it's called The Guard, and it's about two guards uh, who uh, guard this uh, very rich building, and everybody has left. It's an allegory. It's kind of a, an allegory, and, and one of the guards is very European-like. He's a doubter. He's, um, he doesn't know for sure. The other one's a more American type who is very straightforward, and I show in the book how his moral principles slowly are crumbling down by the influence of somebody else and how this works, how indoctrination works. So it's a, The Guard is a very uh, political book. It still is. It could, it could be, the book could be about, uh, it was based on the uh, Iraq war when we had this indoctrination of, of George Bush and, and, George, um, and Blair always uh, saying to us, weapons of mass destruction. It was like a word that we were indoctrinated by. Uh, everybody in the end believed there was weapons of mass destruction. So it, it's a book about uh, politics, about world politics, about war, about how some 
very decent person becomes in a situation where he's actually torturing somebody. And you can, hopefully, that's what I tried, explain how he came this far. Now, that's for me is interesting. How do, do his, his borders mm. crumble down? How does this work? Now, that's my way of telling something about the world. Of course, I cannot, you know, it would be ridiculous if I wrote a story about uh, uh, as a refugee, uh, because I'm not. And, um, you know, mm. that's, that's my function, that's my uh, obligation as a writer, and uh, to write stories who are valid, who are important, tell something about us, and especially show us what it is to be human. That's, you know, that's what it all comes down to for me. Thank you. Priya. Priya? Very um, animated in my mind, listening to you all um, over the last minutes and this question of um, literature and politics. And I think my own feeling is that literature doesn't need to be political, but that writers sometimes need to because writers are also citizens. So I'm kind of very much in Ivana's sort of camp in that regard. But for me, actually, this whole conference and the reason I was so happy to be asked um, to, to be part of it uh, is because I think it actually questions this notion of the political and challenges our sense of what the political is and enlarges it. it. And being here and listening to all of you, um, I really have the sense that what we are doing here is kind of living out Hannah Arendt's definition of the political, which is not about party political and being on certain sides, but which is the kind of space and the power that's realized when people come together to think and act together. And I think that's so beautiful. I think that's something that's lost in politics. And to revive that, you know, in this kind of constellation is for me just a really wonderful thing and more of what democracy needs. The lady behind you first. I'm uh, here from the Art Academy Weissensee in Berlin, and I would like to come back to your question and just try it again. Um, I would also like to hear more about the writing part in writing away borders in your very personal writing. So I heard that some of you have sort of an anthropological approach to it. You listen to people and you write down what they say. I heard that you work with empathy a lot and you try to feel yourself into, if I got it right, someone who's close by because it wouldn't be a refugee. Um, the perspective you, you take there. But what about the actual text? Like how do you write? What is it in the writing you do that actually does away with borders? Do you think about that? Do you not think about that? Um, and that goes especially to you two, too, because I've heard less about that in the panel up to now. Thank you. Um, I will try to make this short, because when I start to, to talk about the writing, of course, then you know, there are 100 thoughts, and then I'm very long and very confusive, and so on. Um, you know, it's like, for me, <clears throat> Uh, there are always two important issues, of course, what I write about. And very often, although I don't want to, these are some questions dealing with some social or political issues. But mostly, you know, how is to be individual in the, uh, uh, uh, uh, in the conditions which are not really good, you know, to live in. The second, uh, and maybe even more important, issue for me, maybe the issue in which I enjoy uh, uh, more is the, is the structure itself. Because I always think that how you write is also it's the most political thing. Because how you write not only describe you as a political and creative and unique uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, author or a person, it also um, uh, puts you in, in a sort of the liter literature, or in my case also theater scene, which is, which is small. So when you write, you very well know that you will not reach lots of people, that you will reach only ones who are interested in style, in structure, in some, some, kind, some other issues, issues of, of art and literature. So 
For example, when I wrote a novel, Rio Bar, it was the novel dealing with, with the war in ex-Yugoslavia, with some, with, with some certain things, certain uh, uh, uh, uh, events in this war. What I did is that I tried to combine as many perspectives that I can. I didn't come like, like I will write a truth, no. I will write from one position, no. I will say who the enemies, no. I will try to write a political, political novel without enemies just with the people who cannot communicate, who cannot understand each other. And then I used interviews, uh, documents, transcripts, my own fiction. So I tried to, it, it is not really collage, it's, it's something that everything is merged together in some kind of natural way. But this was my try to write away this kind of political borders, borders of misunderstanding and, and, and try to make misconceptions the uh, creative. Okay. Rosa Alexa. Okay, so when I think uh, about these borders, what uh, I have, so the biggest border is inside me. So it is the uh, super, super ego, ego uh, what is telling me all the time, this is not socially correct if you write like that. Uh, the language what you used is not socially correct. Uh, you are uh, too brutal, you are whatever grotesque. Uh, and so, uh, so the biggest uh, work for me is to uh, shut down this sound of, uh, this, uh, sound of super ego. And it's always with me. And I always have to fight against it because, uh, because uh, uh, uh, I have to be honest to myself, but it is not an easy job. And another thing is if we really think uh, real borders, like border between Finland and Russia, and you know we have um, this uh, very, very contradictionary and uh, uh, <laughs> quite awful relationship to Russia, and uh, people are not uh, interested in Russia, in Finland, and uh, we can say that uh, there are not uh, so many good feelings toward Russian, uh, Russia and Russia, uh, Russian people. And when I wrote this book, um, Compartment Number no. Six, uh, and it uh, happens in a, a Trans-Siberian uh, train, and in Siberia, and uh, in Moscow, and in uh, Mongolia. So, um, so I just uh, described in the book how I felt what I saw there, and uh, how I felt this atmosphere, and how I felt those people I met. And I didn't put uh, any, any uh, like opinions, I like this or I don't like that. I only described. And when people read this book, so it happened that, uh, that uh, half uh, of the audience usually say that you hate Russia, and the other part says you love Russia. <laughs> so so <laughs> that, uh, that I think that is the way how we write uh, away these borders. Can I just add something that I forgot, and which is Peter. really very important for the literature? <clears throat> and you know, for me, it's important because I write in creation. So the biggest border is the language. And you know, when, now when we are communicated, we have here translators who are really the, the silent heroes of, and they are uh, enabling us to, to understand each other. And when you write, you have the translator who, it's like, drawing a picture which all of you, except my translator sitting here, author and translator, Alida Bremer, can't see if she doesn't uh, draw, it, draw it again Jetzt for sie da vorne in der ersten Reihe. Now she's there in the first row. This is also, uh, this is, I think, one of the very important borders uh, uh, to think about when we think about literature. 
uh, unfortunately, I think that this panel was didn't go in, in these directions because uh, uh, conditions in which we talk, situation in which we talk, is different. I think that the conditions of writing and publishing books have changed, so this discussion didn't go so much towards the literature, but yeah, I had a feeling that I must uh, uh, say this because I think it's, it's fair. Absolutely. Absolutely. A very important aspect how the European literature market is developing. We also heard yesterday that it would be one of the great benefits of Europe that language in Europe it has become translation. Um, after we um, got heard the statement how uh, cross-border your work as a publisher is, how it is for you when you write? How do you overcome borders? You also said that um, these the geographical borders are crossed also within the Kurdish literature. But what it is like for you personally when you write? Evet, bugün ağırlıklı olarak biraz da işte politika ve edebiyat gündeme getirildi. Today we discussed particular in particular politics and literature, but in each country defines it differently. Um, what is political depending on where you live? It's uh, different. As Meli said, you can be political just by writing in a specific language or by selecting a certain topic. Meli gave an example. Uh, to which I would like to sub subscribe. A couple of years ago, I had to pay a fine because I wrote in Kurdish. You had, could be sent to prison because just by using the Kurdish language. And we said geography is destiny. We write where you live. No author would become into the, or get into the center of um, the of politics. You, the writers would like to sit in their room to write a novel, but sometimes the place where you happen to live forces you to become political. You don't have any choice. Very often that is the case. And as Peter said, I'm telling stories about human beings. I wrote four novels and three short stories. And I usually wrote about people who had undergone disasters because these are things I best know, which I've experienced myself, because we are living through disasters. And in my last novel, I'm telling a story of a village whose inhabitants are waiting that the village will be burned. I'm telling the story of waiting for your own village to be destructed from the point of view of these people. In my texts, in my writing, I try to tell these stories to my readers in different languages. I think uh, literature can do this perfectly well. There are three more requests for the floor, Uwe Karsten Heyer, Uwe Wilkins, and then you. I wanted to say that the disc I've seen this discussion as an extremely political debate which, debate, which is necessary because each of you writes from a certain position. And without this position, you wouldn't be able to write without a very clear position, without empathy with respect to injustice of what you perceive as social injustice, but also political oppression to take sides for people who need this to survive. That is how I understand your discussion. I live in a country which is considered to be particularly rich and great, not described by me, but by many like this. And in this country is one child out of five lives below the poverty line, has no possibility to participate. We have 7 million of people who can read or write and 8 million of so-called functional illiterates. 
and we have mass of schools where people go, they're afraid because they don't know whether the roof will come down while they sit there. So as writers, and we have to take sides those who are suffering here in our country. The suffering is different from suffering in Croatia, and the pressure is different, of course, and can't be compared with the situation in Turkey, of course. And in Belgium, well, you the two languages have caused problems, but you don't kill yourself, so which is progress, some progress. And what I hear from Finland or Croatia, um, we when um, I, I didn't know um, what you said, and I asked myself, why? Why don't I know this? And and everything you said was very political. And I cannot imagine how you can live without a very clear position, which has a political effect. And that is why I don't quite understand what our Belgium friend wanted to say, but I understand everything what the rest said. Uh, one thing what I want to say that um, in in Finland when we this is politics but I have to anyway uh, say this so uh, new government when they made new government and took uh, this uh, populistic party and this Nazis also part of that uh, uh, government it was very well done. Because now uh, supporters of that party has gone uh, very low because it's a democratic system and they are in the government and they have to deal with other parties. And that is fantastic. But in Sweden they made different. They didn't take this party to the government. And now it's all, all the time going up and up and up this party because it's not in government. So uh, I'm sure that uh, democracy, if we really take good care of democracy, so this will uh, function. Andre, yeah, Andre Wilkins. Um, yeah, I found the discussion auch um, super spannend. Aber it was an exciting debate, but there is an aspect I was missing since I'm writing about borders right now. I.e., the question: What's good about borders? It's always good to uh, argue against ba borders or boundaries, and all those who've not been born behind a wall are, of course, uh, against borders and boundaries, but there's also something good about borders. For example, in Europe, we have abolished borders in Europe, but we have erected new ones that establish new uh, systems and standards. Today, we talk about TTIP, and there are some who want to do away with borders, others organize uh, protests in the streets and say, we do want. Uh, borders because we don't want TTIP and we do want to safeguard our uh, borders and our standards. And nobody's in favor of borders. Yeah, right, but if you consider a title a metaphor, you have different ways of understanding it. Uh, I am Joe, uh, an author from Iceland and one of the participants here, and I've really been enjoying yesterday and today. And one of the things that uh, I have experienced is uh, how, uh, how uh, various and different approaches uh, we can have as authors, both when it comes to direct political uh, engagement uh, in our lives and in our writings, and how we can also approach the whole issue from the point of view of uh, the author and the aesthetics of writing. And I think it is important that we do not try to fix any roles. We, that we do not say, this is the way an author should behave in a political uh, situation, or this is how we should write when there is a massive crisis. Because we should always be on the side of the author and literature. 
because there are, there are enough people who are trying to tell us what our roles are and what literature is for. And uh, for example, the most avant-garde, experimental, seemingly useless poem is a text that is working on the borders of what is possible in language. And when we are working with what is possible in language, we are working with what is possible in thought, and we are creating new tools to answer back when our reality is threatened. So I think we should also respect those who want to sit in a cabin in the woods and write one poem a day about a little something they find on the forest floor. A poem like that could become the most important tool in an hour of crisis. Thank you. Um, thank you for saying this. Because I think now, as we must conclude something, uh, I, must, I, I feel as I really have to defend Peter, and I won't. Uh, because I completely understand what he said, and it's very similar to what you said. And it's identical to what I think. I really believe that in situation as this is now, um, uh, the, the position of writer, not position of citizen, position of writer and writing and literature must stay in some way intact, must stay aesthetical and must stay beautiful because if you have the society with a tendency to become full of hate, full of fear, uh, uh, full of hysteria, then you really need to show the other option that Okay, we might not have political power, but we have some kind of will. We have a vision of better and healthy society. We, we, we have a tool to make the world really beautiful. And we have style. And we will win. Immerhin verfügen wir über die Instrumente. Right. We do have the tools to make the world a beautiful one. Rosa, please. A little anecdote what happened yesterday, because uh, this is so funny when we think about history. I'm very interested in history, and, and uh, I know that we can't le learn anything about history. But anyway, <laughs> so I met uh, two, um, three teenagers on the street and yesterday, and I asked them, they were like six, 15, six, 16 years old, five, five uh, boys and girls, and I asked them, can you tell me, uh, am I now uh, uh, on the former um, uh, area of uh, Eastern, East Berlin? They look at me. What East Berlin? There are no East Berlin. <laughs> what East Berlin? They asked me. And then, then I went to this, uh, this uh, museum of uh, Checkpoint Charlie. And there were two uh, girls uh, working there in this museum. Uh, so I uh, paid my ticket and I asked these girls, uh, can you tell me in which direction was the former East Berlin and where was the West Berlin? So the East Berlin, West Be No, no idea about that. And they were working in this museum. <laughs> so so uh, let's uh, leave the history. <laughs> Vielen Dank. Thank you. So this should be the two concluding remarks by two writers who are close to the North Pole, Sjorn from Iceland and Rosa from Finland. I don't want to make a summary and I am looking forward to the next panel, which will be about what language we speak or use.